The day has finally arrived. React developers are getting the React compiler. Other frameworks like Svelte and Vue and Solid and Quick all have compilers, but React doesn't have one until today. And this compiler is amazing. It definitely does not disappoint. And I think I can say at this point, in my opinion, this is the most advanced compiler in the front end framework world. Let me start by showing you an example application. It's a simple application and it's got a header on top and then it's got these two incrementing counters. Now the state for those counters is actually up above in the app component itself. So what do we think happens when we click on this increment button? So now all four of those components re-render. The app re-renders, which means that the header re-renders, which means that both of those counters re-render. But that's normal for React, or at least it used to be. Check out how it runs with no code changes at all when instead we use the React compiler to generate the code. This is the React compiler version. I'm gonna click on that same increment button. And as you can see, only the app and the single counter that we clicked on re-rendered. That's because the React compiler has created code that is memoized to the header component, as well as both of the counter components. When the app re-render happens, the code that was generated by that compiler sees that there are no changes required for the header or the other counter, so the memoized versions are returned. And so you get super granularity when you're updating with no additional effort at all on your part. Just use the React compiler, and with well-written React code, you'll start getting the benefits right out of the gate. Well, okay, maybe not right out of the gate. It's not in its final form yet. Right now, it's still in development, and so I wouldn't put it into production, but I gotta be honest with you. Meta products like Instagram have been running on this for a while, so it's not too far off. Let's go through one more example before we dig into the guts of this thing and see exactly how it works. So here you got another example. It's got a counter again on the top, and that just helps us to re-trigger the re-render of that component. What we're actually looking for is on the console side over here, every time I click increment, we should not be resorting those names because those names don't actually change, nor does the sort function. So let's go try and fix this over in our non-React compiler code. So what's happening here is this sort function is getting called multiple times. So one thing I wanna do is wrap it in a use memo. Now, what do we depend on? We depend on the names as well as the sort function itself. All right, let's see if that works. So I'll hit refresh and then increment a bunch more times and nope, it's still giving us the same sorting of names. So why is that? Well, if I go into my sort example, you can see that the sort names function is getting regenerated every time the sort example component re-renders. So we're getting a new reference for this sort names function that we're sending on to the sorted list of names. So to fix that, I need to bring in use callback. In this case, it's an empty dependency array because the sort names function doesn't actually look at any local state in order to figure out how it's gonna do its sorting. So let's hit save and then try it out again. And now everything's fine. We only get one sorting of the names because we have used use memo and use callback to fix our referential identity problem. Here's the good news though, with the React compiler, you don't need to do any of that. Here's the exact same example without the use memo or the use callback, but this time with the React compiler compiling the code and I hit increment and there's no updating to that sort function. That sort function never gets called except for the first original time. To really understand what's happening here, we really should take a look inside the compiled code. Now to do that, I built my own REPL. It's available in a GitHub link below. The meta version of the REPL, which is probably far better than mine, is available as well. There's a link to that in the description, but that wasn't available at the time I was doing this video. So we're gonna muddle by with my version of the REPL, which of course you can play with in the GitHub link in the description right down below. All right, here's my janky version of the REPL. So before we get into what the React compiler generates, we really should take a look at what the current version of the transpiler creates, because if you don't know how JSX is turned into actual running code, then it can get a little confusing as you look at the output of the React compiler. So here's what's generated today from the function on the left-hand side, this hello function. What's actually generated is this function on the right-hand side that uses this underscore, underscore, JSX. Now, the underscore, underscore, JSX is what JSX actually turns into underneath the hood. 
The first argument to JSX is the tag type, in this case a div. Second argument are the props, in this case the class name of foo. And then the third and any following arguments are the children of that component. In this case, it's the text of hi there. So what does this look like with the React compiler? So I'm going to click over on the React compiler tab and see what the output of the React compiler looks like. It's going to bring in this new hook called use memo cache. Now what use memo cache allows it to do is to create an array of cacheable elements, in this case, just one, and it's going to take parts of the component and assign them to slots within that memo cache. So it's going to start off by taking that JSX and assigning it to T0, then putting it in that use memo cache slot and then returning T0. Now what use memo cache is going to do is just like any other hook, the next time this hello function is called, it's going to get back that array, that dollar array of cacheable elements. And it's going to look to see, is there any change in zero? And in this case, there's not going to be any change to zero. So it's just going to return whatever was the zeroth element in there as T0. For this particular example, this is effectively the same as memoizing the component. Let's take a look at a more deeply nested example. So this example is a bit more deeply nested. We had a strong tag in there and it doesn't matter to the compiler. The compiler has looked at how the code is structured and seen that that tree, the div and the strong is one unit and it's caching that one unit. So that tree could be arbitrarily complex and it would still roll it up into a single cache entry as long as there is no dynamic elements inside of it. All right, let's take a look at some data. So in this example, we've got a constant with a name, Jack, and then we're going to just output that constant. And you can see that this is where the compiler has really kicked in. This is why I say that this is the most advanced compiler that I've seen in the front end space. It's because it's looked at that constant, seen that that constant is unchanging, and actually just removed that constant altogether and just simply added it as part of the JSX invocation. It's actually actively refactoring the code. And that's why I say this compiler is an incredible piece of work. It's taking the AST that's given to it by Babel, and it's actually reconfiguring and rebuilding this component on the fly and creating an entirely new AST and giving it back to Babel for continued processing. Hold up. At this point, you might be worried that your code is getting moved around by the compiler. But in reality, optimizing compilers that rewrite code have been around since the early 80s when we first got pipelined CPUs. Every piece of software we use on our computers or on our phones every day is compiled by an optimizing compiler. This is just us as front end developers now getting those same kind of benefits of that compiler on the front end. We as human engineers manage the logic and the compiler handles optimizing it to make it faster. All right, let's get back into the action. Now let's jump ahead to our counter example. This is what the current transpiler would look like. You just have a use state, and then you have the JSX, and any time this component changes state, it's going to rebuild that entire JSX tree. Now let's take a look at the React compiler version. So in this case, the compiler has looked at our code and seen that we have a count, it is dynamic, and we are going to assign it to this p tag. So it's going to create a cacheable element, this zeroth element, as that particular p tag. You also see that it's smart enough to move the set count, which is dependent on count, into that cacheable element, even though it's actually defined when the button code right below it. And the button isn't actually defined until this T2 block. And then finally, there's a T3 block at the bottom that brings it all together. So if count changes, then that zeroth block will get re-updated. The T2 block will get re-updated. And then the T3 block will get updated and then returned. Now, a lot has been said about this compiler and its removal of use memo and use callbacks. So let's see that in action. To demonstrate that, we've now added a doubled count to our counter component that just simply doubles the count. And as we can see in the current transpiler, we invoked the use memo just as is. But what happens when you get the React compiler looking at it? Well, in this case, we just remove the use memo altogether and just simply run the calculation in place. So what happens when the compiler sees something that isn't well-written React? Well, as it turns out, it has a fallback where it just simply lets the original transpiler go. So let's take a look at an example of that. So in this case, we're doing something fairly funky in our assorted list component. We're getting a list of names. It's a list of strings. And then we're setting this new names state to that incoming prop. And what we want to do is if the prop of names ever changes, we want to go and set new names to that new prop. 
Now, a lot of folks hack this by using use memo, and this is not the way that use memo is supposed to be used. So if we remember back in counter double, we actually ran the use memo code right in line. So on line six, you've got the exact count times two, and we have removed the use memo. Problem is that if we remove the use memo here, we're actually going to get in an infinite loop where we keep continually setting new names over and over and over again every time we re-rendered. In fact, actually, the linter tells us this, and so there's an additional linter that comes along with a compiler that helps you get around problems like this. But the really cool thing is, what the compiler does is smart enough to know that in this case, compilation is only going to hurt the component. It's actually not going to make it any better. So what it does is it falls back on the original transpiler and just says, yeah, we're just going to create a regular component out of this. We're not actually going to put in our compiler optimizations. And that's actually a really interesting behavior. Take a look at this intermixed file. So here's two components, sorted list and header. The compiler has evaluated both of those components and found that it couldn't preserve the use memo in the sorted list. So it said, I won't optimize that component and instead let you have it your way. But the header, it can safely optimize. So it's going to convert the header and use its caching in the header, but it's not going to use it in the sorted list. So you might be saying to yourself, hey, it's cool that I don't have to use use memo or use callback anymore, but what about use effect? Do I still have to write dependency arrays for use effect? Well, unfortunately, yes, you do, but the React compiler does help stabilize the non-primitive references in your use effect dependency arrays. So if you depend on things like functions or objects or arrays, it's very likely that it will help you fix some of your issues where your use effects are running out of control. Let's go take a look at a very simple timer example that demonstrates how the React compiler helps you with use effect. So here's the non-compiled React app, and we're getting this timer component mounted every time we go into the use effect. And the reason that we're running the use effect over and over and over again is that the reference to the adjust time function that's actually doing the work of adding seconds on is getting rebuilt every time we go through this function. That means that dependency array is changing, which ends up creating a new timer. That's not what we want. Check out the exact same code, but this time running on the compiler. What's happening under the hood, if we go back into my REPL, is that the React compiler is creating a T0 variable that holds the adjust time function, and it's never going to change that adjust time function. It's just going to create it once and then cache it off in $0. Then down the second block, it's going to create the cached body for the use effect, as well as a cached dependency array, and then it's going to pass both of those on to the use effect. So what it's doing is stabilizing all those references for you and fixing what is a very common mistake when it comes to use effects that depend on functions, arrays, or objects. All right, before we wrap up, a couple of important things to really emphasize. One, React 19 does not include the compiler. Second, there is a rules of React, and there's a link in the description right down below that you should follow when you're writing your React code, regardless of whether you're compiling or not, so you can make sure that you're compatible with the compiler when you decide to use it. Next, we should really be experimenting starting today, but adopting when it becomes more stable. Another important note is that MobX is simply not going to work with this compiler. It's just a fundamental issue with proxy-based state management and this model because the compiler can't detect the use of a proxy at build time. Also, as we go forward, I would anticipate that there's going to be a time when we have new libraries that only work correctly when they're compiled, and that's probably going to cause some headaches, and I think that's just to be expected. On the plus side, you should also look forward to further optimizations to the compiler itself to do more than just memoization. You could imagine it choosing from different rendering models based on the layout of the component, maybe using something like block rendering, like million.js in some cases. I can even foresee a time when it potentially removes the need for dependency arrays. That'd be awesome. Now, I'm not going to say that any of that is going to happen, but having a compiler now opens the door for all of that. Long story short, this is a whole new era of React, and we'll be writing React very differently starting pretty soon here. And I don't think any of us really know exactly where this is going to go, but I can say with confidence that I'm really excited to be on this ride with you, and I really appreciate Meta giving me an advanced look at the React compiler so that I can bring all of that information to you. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this first look at the React compiler. I'm sure there will be many more to come. In the meantime, I am working on a course on Next.js. It's called pronextjs.dev. Head over there right now. Give us your email. You get onto a free newsletter and also get access to really great tutorials on state management and forms management. I'm super proud of it and will be coming out really soon now. So look forward to that in the near future. In the meantime, of course, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell and be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.